Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, vielen herzlichen Dank, dass Sie auch für den zweiten Teil heute hier sind. I continue in English because our discussion is also in English. Um, <coughs> cultural, culture and science funding today on first sight doesn't look like a Wittgensteinian uh, topic, but it is, as we will uh, discover very soon. I thank uh, all our guests very, very much, especially the guests who are uh, with us for the first time today, Dr. Eva Novotny, Bern Olstadt, Dr. Uh, Christian Wittdöring and Ilias Kahn. Thank you very much for trusting the Wittgenstein Initiative and uh, gracing us with your presence. Over to Knut Olaf. Thank you. Thank you, Ra Thank you so much, Ramila. Our topic in this session is uh, a very comprehensive and demanding one. We'll be, we will try to throw some light on the situation for funding, both public and private, funding of culture and science in some countries in the Western world today, but also in a historical perspective. It's uh, especially suitable that we discuss these issues in Vienna tonight in the context of a modern European society and with a history immensely rich with patrons and private philanthropy. And both uh, Stephen Beller and Christian Witt Döring will enlighten us on this fascinating topic, the historical, historically relevant material and, and uh, the histories. The relation between public and private funding is um, quite different from country to country. So uh, we would like to ask, what is, what is the situation today in Scandinavia, for example in Norway, in Austria, Great Britain and the United States? And is there anything to learn from Vienna around Van der Siecke, 1900? There were lots of patrons and philanthropists in this great city. What uh, characterized them or distinguished them? And why were there so many right here at just that time? What are really the social, cultural, economical explanations for that? So these are some of the interesting, interesting questions we will discuss tonight with a very competent panel, panel and with you in the competent audience. And um, the audience will be engaged and involved uh, when around 20, 30 minutes are left. 30, I, I, I will try. That is around uh, uh, 8.30. I think uh, since the panel is so big, I, I will, uh, with five persons, I will introduce them as we, as we go along so that you have their... Uh, uh, their uh, facts and their profiles uh, fresh, fresh in mind. We will start with um, Dr. Eva Novotny. She is uh, president of the Austrian UNESCO Commission and she is also chair of the board of the University of Vienna. She has a very interesting career in, uh, <clears throat> in politics and uh, diplomacy. She has been the Austrian ambassador to uh, France, to the United States, and also, if you read her uh, uh, CV, you can read uh, a line where it states, ambassador of the Republic of Austria at the court of St. James. I love that expression. So do I. <laughs> and of course, all of you know where the court of St. James is situated. Uh, Eva Novotny was also don't you? All, all, all know about it, yes. Great Britain, London. Uh, Eva Novotny was also a foreign policy advisor to the Austrian Federal Chancellor for a decade, from 1983 to 1992. She is the author of numerous articles on questions concerning international relations, and she serves on the board of directors of a number of foreign policy research institutes. Please, Eva Novotny, welcome. Well, thank you very much for this, for this introduction, this very generous introduction. I have to confess that I, I do feel a little bit like an imposter, yeah? because I'm neither a philosopher, I'm not a Wittgenstein specialist, uh, I've just sort of a general interest, and, and so on. 
But uh, as when it comes to funding issues, especially funding issues for culture and for science, I'm now on the receiving end, yeah? <laughs> having been involved in, in uh, sort of on the other side of, of, of the political half, yeah, for, for many, many years and for almost most of my professional uh, career, I'm, I'm now in a position where I take with gratitude what is handed out to us. And uh, that's uh, a paradigm change uh, with which I'm still coping. I'm not quite, uh, quite arrived. Uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether uh, I mean, Stephen Bella is going to talk about history and, and, and Mr. Vitoring is also about to talk about history. But nevertheless, when I talk about our funding situation today, I have to make or I have to start out with uh, a, a brief historical reference. Yeah? Because if you look at the Austrian history, uh, sponsorship uh, of art, of culture, of science, was always the realm of the imperial house, of the high aristocracy, and very importantly, in the context of Austria, the church. We should not forget the church, which was through the 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, especially for very political reasons of the faith, a big sponsor of the arts, of science, and, and, and of cultural and, and creative activity in, in general. I mean, just to keep everybody on the straight and the narrow and, and on, the, on the real face as a reaction to reformation and, and, and so forth. Uh, then, in, in and, and uh, I mean, the, the other two speakers will go into more detail, I presume, but, uh, but I would just make a brief reference that at the end of the 19th century, then really it was the bourgeoisie <coughs> who came and joined the play. And it was uh, also for reasons of uh, sort of self-fulfillment, self-esteem in the society. We had extremely wealthy <laughs> industrialist families and so on who got involved in, in, in sponsorship issues, got involved in, in, in the development of cultural life and, and so forth. And, uh, and also got involved, which is not negligible at all, into issues of cultural education. So it, it was at the end of the 19th century that this whole concept of Volksbildung and so really started, uh, started to begin and, uh, and uh, which was then so important in the, in the first half of the 20th, 20th century. Uh, 1914, 9% of the Viennese population were Jewish. Vienna at that time was one of the major cities in Europe, one of the largest cities in Europe over two million inhabitants, uh, melting pot of nationalities, of languages, and with an extremely <coughs> fertile intellectual and cultural climate, which is then sort of uh, always uh, summarized or defined as, as, as the fin de siècle Vienna and uh, the special characteristics. And I'm mentioning this because if you make a step forward and look at the situation of today, uh, we are, uh, we, we find ourselves in a situation where it is still the state which has the prime responsibility for the funding of, of culture and of science. Uh, it's uh, all the, the sponsoring activities and the subventions of art, of science and cultural activities are extremely varied and very, very rich, very disorganized, very decentralized. And you have, uh, you have the responsibility of the federal government and you have responsibilities in the funding issues of the lender, of all the lender, and down to the level of the community. Yeah? So uh, this having been said, uh, you, you can imagine that there is a vast array of different funding issues and that it is extremely difficult to define them and to... to organized in, in, a, in a structured way for, for a presentation. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, sponsorship of the arts and sponsorship of science is not in the Austrian constitution, but it is based on a special law that was passed in 1988, the Kunst- Kulturförderungsgesetz, and that is the basis for all the funding issues with which we are dealing today. Uh, the federal government in 
2015 uh, had uh, a, a budget of about 443 million euro for cultural sponsorship issues. Private giving in comparison, so just that you see the, the relationship, uh, in 2015 figures at about 5.3 million euro. So there is a huge gap and that shows that uh, uh, socially as well as also in the tradition, private giving is not on, uh, does not have the same value, does not have the same importance that it has, for instance, in the Anglo-American world, where there is a tradition that somebody who is doing well in society feels obliged to give back. Uh, the, the government is trying with a number of initiatives to promote private, private sponsorship and private giving activities uh, with a number of legal measures uh, aiming at uh, the trust funds, aiming at the foundations and, and so on, uh, crowdfunding uh, activities and, and so forth but so far with a very limited success. The uh, sponsorship that is, uh, so that uh, the federal government uh, is, is, is doing is extremely varied. It covers opera, theater, uh, museums, the National Library, contemporary art, architecture, film, photography, everything, and it's a little bit, uh, apart from sort of certain issues that are definite and that are given and that have to be uh, dealt with, like the, the, the financing of the museums, the financing of the National Library, of the state opera, of the big theaters, uh, it, it's a little bit like the Gieskanne, you know, you a little bit here, whoever comes gets something, sometimes more, some, sometimes, uh, sometimes a little bit less. Uh, then we come down to the to the level of the lender, and here, of course, the, the Austrian sort of the states that compose the nine states that compose Austria, the lender as we as we call them, are very independent in defining their own cultural activities. So they are also there is a huge variety of uh, of, of issues here. You have uh, the city of Vienna. Or the, Vienna also in our constitutional setup is a land in itself, uh, is extremely involved with uh, uh, a multitude of sponsorship issues and invests a lot of money in the theatre scene, in contemporary art, in the Festival of Vienna, in monument protection and, 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 and other issues. Uh, while other lenders are more hesitant and uh, concentrating more on folk art and, and so on. I've seen with, uh, with some, some surprise and astonishment that in Corinthia, for instance, even the purchase of a gum spot for a hat can uh, claim cultural funding yeah? because it's part of, of, the, of the folklore. We have been uh, discussing what the proper translation of Gamsbad is and then have decided that we just leave it like that. <laughs> I think everybody knows what we are, what we are talking about. Uh, <coughs> a huge percentage of, of the budget that the federal ministry, uh, or the, now it's the federal chancellor has, uh, chancellery has for, for cultural funding, goes of course to the Bundestheater. Yeah, state opera, Burgtheater, Volksoper. Uh, there's a huge complex uh, where sort of we mainly see only the tip of the iceberg, yeah? But we're talking here about 2,400 employees. They take uh, about uh, 246 million of the budget, which is almost half of, of, of the budget that is there. Uh, on the other side, and, and it's the biggest cultural uh, concern really worldwide in a worldwide comparison. On the other side, uh, they enjoy a 98% attendance, which is not bad. So ticket sales are also an important, an important figure. Uh, and they are an important economic figure because they pull in, uh, there is um, the, the 
tourism and, and so on. So there are a lot of fringe uh, effects that are, uh, that are of importance. Uh, we are, and that uh, one, one, should not, uh, one should not forget, it has to come into the, the general picture, we are a member of the European Union, and so sponsorship and funding issues are also uh, a European Union issue. Uh, the European Union has a special <coughs> program set up from 2014 till 2020, which is called Creative Europe. Uh, sponsorship and development of cultural activities and creativity throughout the, the European Union uh, with a budget of about 1.4 billion euros. So that's a very rich and important funding source for all sorts of, especially contemporary art movements that are a little bit uh, sort of cutting edge and, 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 uh, and need uh, sponsorship. Uh, and we are a member of UNESCO, and uh, UNESCO obliges us uh, under an international convention that was passed a couple of years ago uh, that deals with cultural diversity to sponsor and to support also cultural activities from other countries and other uh, nationalities and so on on the Austrian, on the Austrian soil. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Cultural Diversity Convention goes in two directions. It on the one side entitles uh, states to protect their own cultural activities and to support their own cultural activities, but at the same time obliges the state to support also the activities from other countries that are, uh, ha that are happening on your, on your territory. So that's in, in the whole issue of supporting cultural activities is a very, a very important point also. Let me conclude with a brief word about the, the funding of science, which is uh, a very sad uh, subject, uh, subject in Austria at the moment. Uh, we have 22 universities in Austria. All of them are largely underfunded and are dealing sort of with uh, Mangelwirtschaft. You know, it's, uh, we are dealing with, with uh, very inadequate funds and trying uh, sort of to, to maintain a certain, a certain level of, of things. The, the budget for, 2000, for 2016 for all the 22 universities is uh, 4.2 billion dollars. A large percentage of that goes to the University of Vienna, which is the biggest university uh, in Austria. Uh, 93,000 <coughs> students, uh, about altogether 130,000 people that are working there. The biggest, uh, second biggest employer in Vienna, uh, directly after sort of the city administration, and a huge economic factor also in, in the economic life of, of, of the city. And the rest uh, is, is divided among the other 21 universities. In addition, there are funding instruments uh, that have been set up, but that are also not over richly endowed. Uh, there is uh, the Forschungsförderungsfonds, which enjoys, uh, which supports Grundlagenforschung, sort of the basic research uh, activities, uh, with uh, about 100 million euro per year, uh, which if you think of the whole uh, science and research activities that are going on. This is not an, 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 an overly massive uh, amount of money. There is the Austrian Academy of Sciences, which uh, also lives from, from uh, the, the federal budget, and uh, the newly founded Institute for Science and Technology that is in Lower Austria and that is funded partly by Lower Austria and partly by the, by the federal government. And that is not a teaching institution, but an institute only devoted to, to research. Uh, we are, and, and this is something that I really want to stress uh, for, for the situation of the university also, as difficult as the financial situation is, we are very successful in uh, getting international research grants. 
And here is the most important instrument are the European research grants from the European Union, where the University of Vienna has now about 30, and that has become a very important funding instrument in addition to that what the, what, what the state uh, is doing. Uh, and by necessity, we are also looking at uh, all the grants that are coming from foundations, that are coming from industry, that are coming from research-oriented uh, industries and, and so in order to make do. Um, let me conclude with, with a very brief word about the, the situation at the University of Vienna. Vienna sponsors, in the city of Vienna, 27 different theater groups. So that's the independent sector, independent from the, from the, the, the big state theaters. It sponsors the Wiener Festwochen, which is a major enterprise uh, lasting for, for, for one month. It is, the city of Vienna goes massively into film and uh, su support of film industry as well as in television. And the city of Vienna is also very actively involved in uh, scientific research and in giving science grants and, and research grants uh, through a special instrument that was set up in the, in the, in the city of Vienna. Uh, the, the field is very diverse and, and, and very rich and it goes also from sort of the Architekturzentrum Wien, where they deal with modern architecture, uh, to uh, Förderung, uh, uh, research institute for wildlife uh, ecology that is also supported by the, by the city of Vienna. So the field is very wide and, and, and extremely rich. I think I'll stop here and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Novotny. Let me introduce Ilyas Kahn now. He is a fellow at St. Edmund's College, Cambridge, but best known in Wittgenstein circles for um, providing the funding that allowed uh, the University of Bergen in partnership with Trinity College, Cambridge, to bring uh, Wittgenstein's Nachlass in the form of something called an intelligent facsimiles. I would like to hear what these intelligent facsimiles are. Um, to bring them into the open public domain, accessible for anyone and uh, everyone, without cost and without intimidation. Ilya's primary interest and focus is on mathematics and theoretical physics, and he has recently been one of the key funders behind the new journal Discrete Analysis that was founded as a way to challenge academic publishing in mathematics. And through his uh, St Stanhill Foundation, uh, Ilias has uh, supported academic research, scholarship, and debate by direct donations to individuals and organizations. <clears throat> he is the founder and was the publisher for a decade of the Asia Literary Review and has provided financial support to a variety of writers and literary festivals. And in his private life, he's also well known um, book collector and is uh, reputedly the <laughs> owner of the best collection of Henry James first editions in private hands. And Ilias is also, and that's also relevant here, the chairman of the Stephen Hawking Foundation. So uh, please Ilias, you are uh, uh, one of the main representatives of um, foundations and funders in this panel. Uh, but you are free to to have wh whichever perspective you, you want to in your introduction, please. Well, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this um, conversation. What I have to say is very brief um, and hopefully relevant. I'll be talking for uh, significantly less than 20 minutes and I will talk about the reasons why we funded the, um, the Wittgenstein initiative that you discussed um, that was championed by my young brother, Lewis, and also by Trinity College Cambridge. Secondly, I will tell you why we fund um, the challenge to academic publishers and what we believe is both um, relevant 
I can go forward. Yeah. Well, I'll just shout. <laughs> and um, I'll speak louder. And, uh, and lastly, I'll comment um, on um, the basis on which, um, particularly in the United Kingdom, despite moans and groans for the past 20 years, there has been a significant increase in private sector funding um, for academic projects. Um, some of you may be aware that just in the last year and a half, Cambridge University has raised over two and a half billion pounds um, in donations. And that is just one university in the United Kingdom. So these are the three subjects that I will discuss. Um, and as I said, it'll certainly be a lot less than 20 minutes. During the debate or conversation at the end, um, please feel free to ask me any questions. So first of all, why did we provide funding um, to make Wittgenstein's Nachlass um, available to all without intermediation and without cost? And the answer is simple. We believe that all such Nachlass, uh, all such legacies from important scholars should not have fortresses built around them. We are of the opinion that Wittgenstein in particular is a major casualty of the way in which his Nachlass was not available to people from the last 50 to 70 years. We believe that it was an abuse of copyright and we believe that a new generation of uh, scholars starting from last year will be able to make up their own minds on Wittgenstein and not be reliant upon the intermediation of three generations of scholars who in turn have been dependent upon patronage from people who have been uh, providing a particular interpretation. Here in Vienna, um, I think this is particularly important and I will close on this point by saying that we have very clear views on this. We have provided sp sponsorship, scholarship, uh, real money to scholars for over 15 years. Um, we have no intermediation ourselves and the Wittgenstein world is a world which we have directly sponsored. We believe very strongly that the sale of Wittgenstein provenance documents is a crime. Wherever possible, when these things come up for sale, we either tell people not to sell them or we buy them and give them back to the Nachlass or to Trinity. We believe very strongly that profiting privately by selling Wittgenstein's notebooks, uh, letters, uh, is a shame and something that we should all be very sorry about. Now, just my last point on Wittgenstein is an anecdote. Uh, three years ago, I was in Bergen visiting my younger brother over there. Uh, we, don't, we look quite similar. <laughs> and uh, Lewis, I'm talking right here, Alois Pichler. And um, he was very proud of one of his PhD students who is bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, young Wittgenstein scholar. And she, we were introduced and um, I met her. And uh, she said, oh, so why are you interested in Wittgenstein? I said, because he may perhaps be the single most important commentator on the philosophy of mathematics at a time that changed humanity forever. Here in Vienna, we know the period from 1900 to 1940, um, of course, led by Einstein. We had the centenary last year and quantum physics and quantum mechanics and what that has led to in the world that we now live was incredibly important. And Wittgenstein had a lot to stay, say about mathematics. The sad thing is that less than 1% of all the published material on Wittgenstein is about mathematics. He himself, in 1943, when asked to describe himself, said, I am a philosopher of mathematics. He did not say, I'm a philosopher of language, or I'm a philosopher of something else. Now, of course, he had important things to say about these things. But this is how he himself saw. And that is not the way the world knows him today. We will not go into the uh, unfortunate events of the late 1950s and 60s when his um, selected and heavily edited writings on mathematics were published and Kreisel had a lot to say about that. So we will not go into that subject right now. So I was very saddened when this young lady who was one of the shining stars of the future of academic research in Wittgenstein did not know that Wittgenstein had an interest in mathematics. And why is this? This is because for 50 years, we have not been able to read what Wittgenstein himself said. We have relied upon other people telling us what they thought he said. And this is wrong. This is fundamentally wrong. And that is why we made the grant, that is why we made the donation, and that is why we hope that now there is un 
intermediated access to Wittgenstein so people can make up their own minds as to what he said and why he said it. I mean no disrespect here to the previous academics, but the industry that has built up around Wittgenstein is itself very difficult to uh, be polite about. Now, secondly, um, we have been very significant funders and supporters of um, scientific um, and mathematical journals that are not controlled by the large academic publishers. Um, uh, there's a lot that's been said on this subject, so I will restrain my comments to really the following three or four sentences. Um, I don't know how many scientists there are here, but um, effectively, um, there's no reason in the early 21st century for people to have to suffer the indignity that has been imposed upon them by academic publishers. And this is nothing to do with copyright. So Tim Gowers, who is a colleague of mine at Cambridge, is a very fine mathematician, um, has led the charge in certain respects. There's a fantastic um, overlay journal which is available to everybody on the internet called Archive. Some of you must be familiar with it. It's, primarily, it, it's now actually even more important than the mathematical and uh, physics journals. And last year, uh, we launched something called Discrete Analysis. The board of editors um, is more prestigious than anything that exists in mathematical publishing at the moment. Um, it doesn't lose anything in those qualitative terms. It is free, it is open, and it is accessible. It is the way things should be. I have two young sons, one of whom is a mathematician. Well, I hope he will become a mathematician. <laughs> He's studying mathematics. Um, and, um, and he will not have to live in the world that I lived in, i.e. paying for my own papers. Um, I am the chairman of the Stephen Hawking Foundation, and we, I guess, Stephen perhaps is the most recognized human being on the face of the planet right now. If there's somebody more recognizable, I'd like to know, but he is an amazing individual, as you all must be aware, and we both raise and give money um, privately. We are a substantial foundation. Um, we benefit from um, the fact that Stephen is one of the most important scientists currently alive, and if any of you are interested in the ways in which we operate and why we choose to give what we give, uh, I'd be delighted to have a conversation. I don't think there's any point in my saying too much about that. I'll close by picking up on a point which um, was made about um, the state of science funding here in Austria. Um, you know, I'm quite used to people being full of doom and gloom. That is not me. Those words uh, are not part of my lexicon. And I'd like to finish on a positive here, which um, I come to Vienna not because of my association with Wittgenstein, although we are very strong supporters of Wittgenstein. I come here because of the work that is being done on particle physics and quantum computing. And you guys are right at the forefront of that technology. There's a massive amount of funding which is going into that. And I think um, if I were you, if you don't already know it, um, the sorts of impact that the world felt um, in 1905 to 1925 when Einstein, Planck, Schrodinger and Heisenberg and his colleagues, Niles Bohr of course, um, discovered quantum mechanics, those same changes were on the cusp of because of the kind of research which is being done. And here in Vienna you are a leader and you have attracted a lot of funding. So it's not Munich and it's uh, certainly not France. Uh, it, it's, it's Britain and it's Austria in, in this world that really matters. So uh, perhaps a little bit of cause for optimism in, 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 in this regard. Thank you very much indeed again to the organizers for inviting me here and I hope I haven't disappointed you with the brevity of my comments. Thank you, Elias Khan. No, you didn't disappoint. <laughs> and now we'll, uh, we'll uh, move to, uh, to history and historical context. Stephen Beller read uh, history at the University of Cambridge and has written several important and good books on topics with a Viennese connection, including Vienna and the Jews, 1867 to 1938, a concise history of Austria, and antisemitism, a very short introduction. He's currently working on a history of uh, the Habsburg monarchy, 
1815 to 1918 for Cambridge University Press. And uh, will it soon be published? When I've written it, yes. Yeah. yes, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we look forward to it. And uh, Stephen Beller currently lives as an independent scholar in Washington, D.C. Seems like a good life. <coughs> yeah, well, yes, Please. he has his advantages. Um, well, I, I think, we've, I think we've, we've just heard that the, what I'm going to describe now is, is still alive and well and, and, and living in, what, between, between, between here and, I'm sorry, you, where, where are you living? I'm based in Cambridge. In Cambridge, there you are. Yeah. Um, so, um, but not, yes, not the academic bit. Or, yes. But while you're there, so yeah, Eddie's as well, I'm afraid. Where were you? Hmm? Which yeah. college? G Jesus to begin with. Got it, okay. Yeah, went yeah. on. Anyway, never mind. Um, but that's another matter. What but I'm you're right, I'm private. I'm not in You're private, by okay. Right, right, okay. But because the, the point is here that what I'm going to talk about is, is the role of, of private um, pat uh, patrons and funders um, in, the, in Vienna 1900 uh, and, and a little before. Both, both I think, I'll, I'll talk about. Um, Art, art patrons and also uh, uh, patrons of, of the natural science, the natural sciences, um, and this is this is not really a topic about. This is not specifically Jewish patrons. It just happens that m many, if not most, of the patrons I'll be talking about are, were Jewish because of the, the the context of the time. The Wittgenstein family is a, is a key uh, part of this 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 group of patrons. Uh, in, a, in a kind of almost ar archetypally Austrian way, in as much that they were partly of Jewish descent, they were partly Protestant, they were partly Catholic, and they were certainly extremely rich, which is, helps to be a, 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 a very uh, a strong a pa a family of patronage. Um, but the um, so part of what I'm going to talk, and of course, and the other thing is, that I think Ludwig Wittgenstein was mentioned. This is a session about Ludwig Wittgenstein as patron, right? That was one of the what's one of his identities here, and of course he was. He was he he gave up his whole wealth, right, to um, to finance um, many many writers and so forth, right? Well, uh, well, 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 a, well, a very a very large sum was given was given to people like uh, Trakl and so on and so forth. Yes, okay, so. Oh, that's quite a lot of a large amount of money. Yes. Okay. So, so you know, this is this is very uh, apropos Wittgenstein as well. Um, so the question is, what what motivates um, patrons, no, or or, or uh, mecenas, uh, funders? Um, obviously, one of the key uh, reasons why uh, someone would want to fund um, uh, culture or science is that they they believe that's a good idea. Right? Is that they, they, they love art, they love music, they want it to be pros to prosper, so they want they want to encourage it, they'll give money. Money is a good encourager usually of, of doing stuff. Um, second the second reason is is I think especially in, in the context of uh, has been said of of, of uh, many of the especially the Jewish patrons of, of uh, the nineteenth century, is it is it uh, pat patronizing the arts is a, is a good way of integrating into the into High society, right? Um, I think I think in America these days, I think right, you get you get the sense that if, if you if you contribute lots of millions to a, a university or a, or a, or a, an opera house or something, that's one way in which you can be integrated into the high society and get invited to the right parties and so on and so forth. Um, so there's that, and. Uh, there is a sense in which someone like Fanny von Arnstein, for instance, early on, right, the, 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 the funding of the cultural, of the music, music culture in Vienna was a way in which Fanny von Arnstein could, could become integrated into the, the high society of the time. And that's, that's often a, a, a reason put forward why, why so many uh, Jewish families did put so much money into, into art and so on and so forth. There is, however, and, and so um, I was involved in a site controversy some years ago with Ernst Gombrich, who, who was basically say, uh, who quoted Serge Zabarsky saying, well, you know, if you're talking about Jewish patrons of, of, uh, of the secession and so on, as, as Tobias Natter was at the time, uh, if, if, the, if the patrons knew that you were talking about them as Jewish patrons, if they were alive today, they'd be rolling in their graves, as it were. I mean, it's a very bad uh, um, 
logical construct, but you get the idea. Because they didn't think of themselves as Jewish patrons. In fact, that was the last thing they wanted to be. They wanted to be just patrons integrated into the society and assimilated into the society. Um, but the irony is, uh, from that perspective, is there's, a th there's a third reason why, why um, and I think we, we heard it here partly, why, why someone would want to give money to, to encourage the arts, the sciences, and so forth, which is to get their agenda over, which is absolutely legitimate. Right? Absolutely legitimate. They want their values and, and their influence to be felt. And what's interesting in, in, turn, of the, in turn of the century Vienna, for instance, was that when it came to, let's say, the, 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 the funding of the secession, right? um, obviously, obviously Karl Wittgenstein was, a, was an important um, contributor because, because he, he, he put a lot of money into the, uh, into the Secessionsgebäude. Right? Uh, but, but there were also other uh, patrons, such as August Lederer, Ferdinand Bloch, um, Sam, well, and Samuel Vandorfer, at least Fritz Vandorfer, his son, right, who, who, who spent a, he did spend a, almost all his fortune on the, on the Wiener Werkstätte, right? Okay, um, so, and, and then there's Moritz Gallier as well, the Gallier family was also big, big contributors to, um, to the secession and, and Werkstätte so on Art Nouveau Jugendstil in Vienna. And all of those people I've mentioned, August Leder, Ferdinand Bloch, Samuel Werndorfer, and Moritz Gallier, can be seen in, a, in the list of, of uh, uh, taxpayers of the Jewish community in 1910. Uh, uh, is Alan here? Uh, Alan Janik? I mean, ironically, that I, I, got, I got that piece that there's a the fantastic um, right? uh, list of the, of, the, of the taxpayers of the Jewish community in 1910. A courtesy of, of, of Eva Oxall, so, you know, so, so Eva Oxall again. But, right, so the point being here, that right, the, the claim that these, that these Jewish patrons would never have wanted to be thought of themselves as Jewish, right, as kind of outsiders in society, is not right. They, they were quite, uh, people like August Leder and so on, were quite happy to, to see themselves in the, in the list of, in the, of the, the Jewish community. Now, whether they, whether they thought themselves as primarily Jewish, probably not. But that was not a problem for them. Unlike sometimes one gets the sense of what, what real, you know, what, what kind of the, the integrative function of, of, uh, of uh, cultural um, funding is for, for patrons. So right, they, they were just there to, to get the modern art that they thought would be, would be both they liked, but also would suit their agenda of emancipation and modernity, they, w they wanted to encourage that. And, uh, and uh, I think it's important to, to remember that the, the secession uh, at the time was associated with the phrase, um, uh, der, der Zeit ihre Kunst, der Kunst ihre Freiheit. Right? So it's an emancipatory, it was an emancipatory uh, motion. So I think that actually sim that was sim very sympathetic to a, a, a whole class of, of people who, who were also interested in emancipation, their own and the rest of the society. And that goes to the Volksbildung too, which is ex exactly the same kind of, of movement. In fact, some of the people uh, involved, like Heinrich Gompertz, were sort of on all, both sides of that, that equation. So there's that. Um, and, and there was an interesting uh, um, side, sidelight to the, this, which, is, which I think is important, which is that the private funders also had a, a large influence on state funding, right? So, for instance, in 1903, the, the, you, you set up the De Moderna Gallery in the Belvedere, and actually, ironically, in the Lower Belvedere, not where it, not where it is now. <coughs> uh, in 1912, that became the 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 the, 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 the Austrian State uh, um, uh, Muse, the, the Museum of Austrian State, the Austrian State Museum of Art, I think. Let me get yes, that's right. Okay. So, but whatever it was, I mean, the, to go from the modern gallery to Austrian art is an interesting leap, I think, but that's a whole other debate. But the point was that around 1911, there was a society for Muse Friends of the Museum, or for society, Gesellschaft der Museumsfreunde, was set up. And, and again, the leading, the leading figures were people like Ferdinand Bloch, August Lederer, and, and some of the artists and, 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 and art, um, uh, art, art dealers associated, such as Karl Moll. And in 1936, when they had the, the 25th anniversary of the, of the, the, music, of the mm -hmm. society's found, founding, Karl Moll gave, in the introduction to the catalogue, Karl Moll praises August Lederer 
for having saved Klimt's, Klimt's work and, and being able to kind of save it for the, for the for now for the state <coughs> museum. So, right, so the secession becomes actually kind of a, a state-sponsored or uh, organization. Uh, I mean, movement or, or state-identified movement. Um, and, and ironically, of course, a couple of years later, this is 1936, a couple of years later, Karl Moll ends up being on the completely the other side of the equation, which is an interesting um, thing, but maybe we could discuss that. Um, but, and, the, and the fact that the, there was this conscious kind of attempt to kind of get the secession in, in to sponsor the secession and get modern art kind of accepted by the, by the state, right? So, 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 so using private patronage to kind of to feed on state patronage or, or, to, or to, to encourage state patronage is, is, is found in a quote, uh, can be seen in a quote from Berta Zuckerkandl in a note to um, uh, complimenting uh, Josef Hoffmann um, uh, for getting a, a state appointment in February 1912, where she says, uh, she, she wonders what other people who get, who get titles, uh, other members of the secession movement will, will, or, there, or thereabouts, what, what titles they'll get. And she says, maybe, maybe you'll have Klimt von Frauentrieb, which is an interesting uh, concept. Anyway, uh, but anyway, she, she concludes the letter by saying, Und sehr geschickt, dass unsere Revolution, Revolution ein bisschen schwarzgelben Anstrich bekommt. Blöd wie schleicht darum. Right? So in other words, right? There's a sense that they are, they are really, uh, there's a revolution going on, and they are kind of pr providing an emancipatory, emancipatory art. Uh, on this, on another example, if I, if I may, yeah, okay, is the uh, now return to science, and of course, it's similarly, in a way, it's it's all kind of the same kind of families we're talking about. Um, uh, in 1862. Uh, Ignaz Lieben uh, died, and in his will he gave a, a, a large sum of money. Ignaz Lieben was a Jewish banker, uh, um, and he gave a large amount of money to the common good. His son, Adolf Lieben, who was a chemist, um, then converted the, this, this amount of money into the, what, be, has be, what became the Lieben Prize. The Ignaz Lieben Prize, and uh, and from then on, from 1863 until until just until 1938, and then actually subsequently from from I think 2008, it, it, they revived it. Interesting enough, uh, the Lieben Prize was sort of Austria's no Nobel Prize, right, for, for for scientific achievement in the in the in the physical sciences, chemistry and physics mainly, um, and. And the point was that when, when Adolf Lieben basically arranged this, this prize for, for young scientists, young up-and-coming scienti scientists, um, he couldn't get a job in the Austrian, um, in the, in the Austrian uh, academic system because he was Jewish and was not prepared to give up his religion. And at that point, the, the, con the Concordat of 1860, 1855 was still in force. So this is, again, this was a, this was a a prize, a, a, a piece of um, funding, with a very strong agenda, because the point was that the people, the the the, uh, the the prize was open to all people of any confession. It wasn't, so it was a basically a liberal, you know, a throwing down the gaunt, a liberal throwing down the gauntlet. Gauntlet isn't exactly a very liberal kind of expression, but you know what I mean. It was a challenge to the authorities, and in fact, interesting enough, it was a few years later. In fact, in fact that things were changed in Austria. Um, and, and in fact, Lieben eventually did become uh, in fact, not only a, a, a professor in Austria, but or, or ordinarius, which is actually quite, uh, then there's the other side, that was actually quite exceptional for Jews, right? They could be außerordentliche professoren, but not ordinarian. Anyway, um, he did, and he, and he set up the, the, chemical, the chemical faculty. I think the, there are two chemical faculties in, in Vienna at the time, and it, yes. So he, he, was, he was ahead of one of them, basically, and, and, and uh, in, he, he became a very successful um, uh, part of na the natural science community in Vienna. Um, his cousin, Theodor Gompetz, was, was the other, other major uh, Jewish ordinarius at, at the time, and he, he was a, but that was for, the, for classics. So chemistry and classics is an interesting. So, right, so here, here we have another attempt at an agenda to kind of 
liberalize and, and open up um, uh, and encourage the natural sciences in, in Austria, in Vienna. Uh, and so I, th I think, right, this is, these are, so both on the culture, uh, art side and on the, on the science side, you, you, there is always a, a good way in which a, a private funder can help the state make the right decisions. Let's put it that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen Beller. We'll uh, continue with the historical context. My, uh, my own two favorite cities are uh, definitely uh, New York and Vienna. And uh, the next speaker, Christian Wittöring, uh, has and has had a relation in his career uh, to both of my favorite museums in these two cities, namely the Mack uh, here in Vienna and the Neue Galerie in New York. Um, uh, Christian Wittöring uh, is, uh, is uh, trained as an art historian in, at the University of Vienna and his field of expertise is and has been the cultural and stylistic history of furniture and the interior. He started his career as a curator of, uh, fur for fur furniture and woodwork at the MAC, Museum für Angewandte Kunst, the Austrian Museum for Applied Arts, uh, where he served for 25 years until 2004. And from 1999 until today, he's the curator for decorative arts at the Neue Galerie, New York. You should really visit it if you haven't been there yet. And from 2005 until 2013, he, he worked freelance as a consultant in organizing and curating exhibitions, as well as consulting collectors. And for 25 years until 2008, he uh, taught extensively at universities in Austria, the US, and, and Holland. So please, Christian Wittori, floor is yours. Thank you. I just want to produce a few short thoughts which could serve as a base for discussion. Uh, as Knut mentioned, I worked in this world, in this Catholic Austrian world, and also a lot in the Anglo-Saxon Protestant world, two different cultures that one can do this, the other one can do this, and this one can do this and this. But so if you can take the best out of both, <laughs> then you win. <laughs> and it also it has to do with our topic with, with sponsorship. Now, the interesting thing is if you talk about sponsoring in the arts, there's this strange ambiguity between it's serving to distinguish yourself and it's a medium for integration, fitting in. And so, for example, since the Renaissance, uh, sponsorship in the arts has been used to gain visibility in society. And this visibility is there to distinguish yourself. And it's interesting how this word to be distinguished or être distingué, it equals the, the German vornehm sein. Hmm? Vornehm, if you translate it, is to put yourself ahead. And this sponsorship or this, this, this uh, this medium of sponsorship becomes also very relevant always when different layers of society start to or try to mingle. That's also the moment, it's a personal interest of mine is, when books on manners become relevant. And I mean, the way of typical Viennese upbringing, you know, it's if you follow a norm and a form, you'll be successful. You know, the individual doesn't count. It's if you follow a norm. And that's how I was, uh, that was my understanding of books on manners. But in fact, it's not at all about that. You might wonder what this has, to, does this have to do with our topic, but it has. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's 
much more like a psychology. And if you read the first edition of Knigge, it's about finding a common uh, language in behavior where you don't hurt the other one. Hmm? And it's not for nothing, it's getting away now, but it's interesting, <laughs> Uh, that for the, lately you have all these books on manners for managers who need it in the globalized world so that two different cultures can understand each other. Uh, so much for this. Um, yeah, and then the question of fitting in. Uh, you mentioned very rightly that uh, it is not just the case of the bourgeoisie. It's very much, you know, at the beginning is the sponsorship in the arts. It's a case for, it's a matter of the aristocracy and, of course, the church. Uh, it's only here with the constitution of the 1860, uh, of 1860 <coughs> and also the new, the, the full civil rights to the Jewish society that First of all, the bourgeoisie can get a voice in society, as can, uh, can the, the Jewish population of the, of the empire. And again, you know, to visualize this voice, sponsoring in the arts helps. And we always talk about this sponsorship in the arts around 1900, but in fact, you know, it's very, very important from the middle of the 19th century already in the bourgeoisie. And this position is taken by the bourgeoisie and somehow the aristocracy steps back. There are big exceptions, important ex exceptions like the Lanskoronskits and the Liechtensteins. Uh, and why am I talking about this gaining visu uh, visibility? Uh, because I'm always asking myself, since I worked and work in the museum, and I have to do with sponsoring and motivating people, what's the problems that I encounter here? People in this culture are not encouraged to become visible. Mm. Hmm? And if you don't encourage this, you sabotage the whole thing. <laughs> yeah? And another uh, question that I came along, you know, working in this Catholic and the Protestant world is, I dare to say it, <laughs> I think in the Protestant world there's a much stronger feeling of responsibility for the community than it is in the Catholic world. In the Protestant world, my experience, if an individual fails, it taints the whole community. It's not the case in the Catholic world. And yeah, and I leave it by that and we maybe we can continue on that base. Especially you know, for today's uh, problems we have with Thank Thank you, Kirsten Wittering. Uh, last, uh, last panelist is from, uh, from Oslo, Norway. Björn Ulfstar is uh, the general manager of the Association of Foundations in Norway. It's an organization for Norwegian philanthropic foundations. Uh, other types of foundations are also member of, of the association, but your association's mission is to safeguard the foundation's framework in relation to public authorities and support organizational development also of foundations. Ulfstar has a law degree from University of Oslo. He's, a, he's practicing also as a lawyer and he's running the daily management of the association and his previous working experience is as a lawyer in different law firms and as a manager also within financial sector in, in Norway. So please be on Ulfstar. And you have a presentation on the yeah. screen also. Okay, thank you very much. Honor to be here. Um, my task is to talk a little bit about um, how we do it in the Nordic countries. And as you perhaps know that the Nordic countries is Finland, Denmark, Sweden and Norway. In addition, 
Iceland and Faroe Islands too. Uh, we speak the same language in Norway, Sweden and Denmark. So we are very much socially in common. Um, but in this presentation I will main, mainly focus on Norway and funding. Um, in Sweden, uh, which has been a very wealthy country for 400 years, they have a lot of philanthropic foundations. Uh, uh, they become a, a big European power uh, in the mid-1600. And um, they even went as far as Prague, I know, uh, and robbed it. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, so they have a tradition for, um, for foundations. And the Wallenberg family, which you perhaps have heard about, is very, they have huge uh, private philanthropic foundations in Norway, which do two things. They give a lot of money to very good, uh, different kind of social and um, re research um, projects, but I also control the, the Swedish uh, business community through ownership to these foundations into Volvo and other big Swedish companies. So it's a combination of being both um, uh, philanthropic and business. Um, in the Nordic countries, uh, the, the funding of culture and science is mainly coming from public funding. Uh, and it has been a tradition developing the welfare state to build up huge, um, uh, uh, huge uh, positions or, or, or in, in public spending in the way that the budgets gives very generous support to culture and science, uh, scientific research. Uh, but in addition to, to, to giving money to specific uh, areas, there is also what I would say very generous support to museums, from, uh, philharmonic orchestras, and museums. And um, these uh, are also well funded, I would say, in all the three Nordic uh, countries. So, but uh, in Denmark, which is another example, one well, of the richest men, men uh, uh, families in Denmark, he gave away a new opera 10 years ago. And the, the Mask family has now recently given uh, billions to, pre, pre, to support the, the Opera House for many, many years ahead. So they will not be dependent on public spending. <coughs> we also have uh, very generous uh, schemes for uh, research, so I'll come back to that. To uh, and directly supports to universities, hospitals, and independent uh, research institutes. <clears throat> but, of course, the Nordic welfare states, they are under pressure financially, um, especially for Norway these days. We have lived on oil for about uh, 30 years. Oil price is very low, and uh, people are used to living very good. And uh, we have managed <coughs> actually also to, to build up a huge fund, which is an oil fund, about uh, one, today I think, one billion euro. But, but if you start to use out of that money, <coughs> they, it goes easy. So it's in a way, it's, it's, we are moving ahead to a situation where the public spending must be reduced. And in my view, that we will be more, more reluctant on private funding from uh, foundations and uh, private uh, grants. Uh, and in addition, which is my political little uh, say statement, um, is that very <coughs> healthy <coughs> retired people must start to help those retired people who are not that healthy, because the welfare state is not able to handle this in the future. So, and we, in addition to a very generous uh, support scheme. We also have a very generous um, pension system, which is not fundable in the future. So this is what I think that uh, it's not just getting retired and moved to Spain. You have to be in the country and take your part of uh, taking care of other people. Um, but I think that um, that support, public support for cultural purposes will not increase in the coming years, but I believe that support to research will be a priority. 
as a tool to create jobs. So uh, that uh, the government and the parliament will, um, I suppose, uh, put a lot of money into research in hope that that will give a lot of new jobs. When we talk about philanthropic foundations in Norway, which is the association I'm running, uh, we have um, what we call a um, government body, Stiftelsestilsyne, which is a supervisory body for foundations in Norway. They made a survey in 2012. And um, uh, in a way, 2.7 billion NOC is about 270. Uh, um, 2.7 billion NOC is 270 euro, million euro. So you... 10 times. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, uh, over these three years then, these private foundations uh, gave out about uh, 9 billion NOC, which is 1 billion uh, euro. More or less. That's quite good, actually for, for uh, <coughs> private donations. And out of this, this amount, research, 31%, culture, 12, education, 15, social condition, 13, and sports, 6. In Norway, sport is very important, uh, especially skiing and winter sports, as you know. And others, 23%. Percent. We have a government body called the Research Council of Norway, which is then the public institutions, um, which um, support uh, business uh, com companies with special uh, projects. Uh, and you can apply for money and uh, get uh, co-funding. Uh, and in 2014, this research um, Council uh, had a, uh, the fund, the total fund of um, 800 and uh, yeah, around 18, 800 uh, million euro. Um, and the Ministry of Education has also established a system for donation strengthening schemes to raise private funds. So if if a company um, have a project and I have private uh, funding of five million uh, minimum, then the government will uh, support you with 25%, which is a new scheme in Norway, which is, uh, the way is also then move into other parts of, of the society. I'll come back to that. So this is what we call a donation reinforcement uh, by the ministry is also uh, a solution for museums. So if you are getting private funding, a museum is getting private funding to maintenance or buying a new sculpture or um, anything like that, the government will um, uh, support you with 25% of the, the purchase price. It's also quite generous. And then we have the Art Council, uh, which is the main government operator for the implementation of regional cultural policy. This is uh, not that much money, it's about 132 million euros, but it comes on top of uh, then uh, the direct funding of theatres, the Philharmonic Orchestra in many cities, uh, and uh, museums, yes, and, and so it's, it's, this is more for speci spe uh, specific specific project uh, that can apply for support. And last year the government actually introduced a new scheme which is called Talent Norway, which is, um, sorry, no, you, Talent Norway, um, which is a actually limited company between the Ministry of Culture uh, uh, and two foundations to support young talent in uh, the culture area. And this um, company uh, is based on the principle that money from the company, all the government funds this company with 30 million or 50 million a year, and then 
the management have to uh, actually get the same private funding. So last year, the, the, uh, the government provided 30 million, and altogether Talent Norge managed to give away 80 million to young talents within uh, uh, from all kinds of uh, arts, actually. I think it's one of your ideas, isn't it? Um, so that was Talent Norge, which is uh, then an additional scheme here. And um, uh, this, uh, <laughs> the politicians, they were looking into the sport area and saw that the Norwegians were quite good at skiing downhill <laughs> and uh, uh, cross country. I could, I could tell from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then they said, why don't we create, because we have something we call the Olympic uh, uh, top, uh, what will that, um, peak, the Olympic peak, which is a group that takes very young athletes and make them the best in the world. So the minister thought that we have to do the same with uh, talented uh, violinists and uh, uh, yes, other uh, very, very able young artists. So we have to see if this is going to be a success. I believe so. So I will end up here by saying a few words about Denmark too, because Denmark is actually uh, a country with many, many philanthropic foundations. They have the Carlsberg Foundation, which uh, Every time you drink a Danish card's pack, some of the money goes to the foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a drink. Uh, and they, they are a very huge uh, financier in Dan Danish culture. Uh, and uh, they've been, uh, in, they've been in, in operating for over 100 years. Very, very wealthy. Uh, and a so, lot of, actually, industry, or the, the listed company at the Copenhagen Stock Exchange are owned by foundations, which again get then money from the companies they are owning and distribute them to all kind of uh, good projects. So, so traditionally, the Danish foundation then uh, has um, contributed, as I'm writing here, uh, in 2008 with 7.5% uh, percentage of the total research uh, in, um, in, the, in Denmark. And for Norway the level was 269. So a lot of uh, interesting foundations in, in Denmark, yes. That was actually what I had to say, to give a little picture of the Nordic countries. Thank you so much, uh, Bjorn. Uh, the, uh, this session could, uh, could end here. It has been so interesting. Uh, so many perspectives and uh, very stimulating, both the contemporary and the historical perspectives. But uh, we have uh, half an hour still, and we will try to, to, uh, to uh, follow up some, uh, some of the topics. I have a, I have two two different questions, and then I will let you uh, take the floor yourselves in the panel and uh, comment upon each other, and then uh, we'll uh, open up for the uh, the hall and the the audience. Uh, my my first question is: uh, We have had now examples of very different countries, very different traditions and cultures for funding, and it strikes me that. Uh, some of the countries with, uh, with a weak funding of, uh, for example, arts and culture, uh, like, uh, like the US, have, have very st has very strong traditions for, for private funding, both of research and, uh, and uh, culture, arts and culture. Whereas um, countries, affluent countries like uh, Austria, Norway, um, with very strong public funding of both research and culture, uh, do still have very pretty weak uh, traditions for for private funding. Um, and uh, my concern is that um, we we need uh, a more diverse um, landscape when it comes to, to to the number of sources of funding. 
in, uh, in, in uh, societies like Austria and also Norway. Uh, we are in a very privileged uh, situation uh, with our strong and politically uh, supported uh, funding of, of, of research and, uh, and, and especially culture. In, in Norway, during eight years, from 2005 to 2013, uh, the Norwegian government's uh, uh, budgets for, for arts and culture uh, were not cut down, they were not reduced like in so many other European countries. They were doubled, they were increased by 100%. Uh, and this was a conscious political initiative and, and a, a project of, of strengthening uh, publicly supported culture in, uh, well, in uh, one of the richest countries in the world. Um, but uh, in, the, in the midst of this uh, um, privileged situation, I think we need, um, we need more sources uh, for funding uh, to, to uh, simply to, to be able to spread the power to influence our future through, through all the decisions. Uh, there, will, there will be so many blind spots if, if almost all funding decisions are taken by a a narrowing number of, of, of public uh, 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 boards and, and, uh, and commissions. So I, I would like your comments upon this. Um, uh, is this an, do you see this as an important point of spreading power, uh, increasing diversity? Even in our privileged countries in uh, Western Europe, we, uh, we will need in the years to come more private funding uh, of of, uh, of culture and and possibly also of uh, of research and science. Please, Eva Novotny. I think you are absolutely right in this <clears throat> in this diagnosis. I think there is no way uh, around that issue, especially at the times when almost all our governments are cutting back, uh, are sanitizing their budgets, are sanitizing their debt situation. Uh, it will become very important to get a broader involvement uh, in, uh, in, in, in the funding issues. Uh, I would like in that <coughs> context to take up two uh, points that have been made uh, in, 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 in the presentations here. The, the first one is we talked about the influence of the church. And I think that in the case of Austria, I mean, it's of course always da dangerous to speculate about what would have happened if, yeah? But in the 70, beginning, first half of the 17th century, Austria as a country was on the verge of becoming Protestant. And it's very interesting to speculate how the country would have developed if we had really been a, a, a Protestant country <laughs> and not sort of victimized them by counter-reformation and the Jesuits and God knows what. And I think that we have uh, this tendency uh, to look towards the state, to look towards authority, to look towards institutions, is part of that Catholic heritage in the country uh, that has uh, sort of, you know, uh, a subservient uh, uh, well, culture. It's, it's, that a counter it's a counter-reformation. It's a counter-reformation, right? Yes. Because ironically, and in Britain, it, it's yeah, slightly different. Yeah. Right? And in, in, in that context, and, and, and this is something uh, Mr. Witt, uh, Dering has said the visibility factor. I've recently uh, discovered, and it, it's something which, uh, an, an issue in which I've been uh, involved for quite some time, because I've always been arguing that in the Austrian legislation regulating trusts and foundations, we should orient ourselves a little bit on the American model and introduce clauses that oblige trusts and foundations to devote at least a part of the revenue for public good and, and for public purposes. And I've always failed uh, in persuading our ministers of finance to take action on that. And I've now discovered that in this country we have a multitude of trust funds, uh, but no listing. There is no, they are completely anonymous. There is no list uh, where you can, for instance, check uh, who, who has what uh, in, 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 a, in a trust fund. And there's now a small organization that has sprung up that is trying with the means of modern technology to identify 
and, and create a list of, 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 of these trust funds. So the visibility issue here is really important because uh, we try to keep that all anonymously and uh, just in a way to protect private fortune and not uh, sort of spread it out for, for, for different purposes. And the last point which I would like to make, uh, Stephen was very articulate in talking about the, the cultural climate of, of, of the fin de siècle and, and the big names that were in, in, in the sponsor, like Lederer and Blochbauer and Zuckerkangel and so forth. But there were, in fact, and I find that so interesting, many more. And it was really a very broad cultural activity that was going on here. And I'm uh, a part of a, uh, a committee that deals with uh, restitution of art issues. Uh, and uh, there you see, I mean, how many private art collections were not from these big families and the big industrialists, mm -hmm. but were of lawyers and surgeons and uh, doctors uh, and, and so forth, who out of love for culture, and perhaps also, I mean, to, to uh, enhance their own status and, and so going in, into, into the sponsoring issue. But it was a very broad, uh, activity in society. Bjorn Ulfstad, please. In Norway, we had in 2004 four a reform where all foundations, small, big and small, uh, had to be registered in a government register. Good idea. And you have to send uh, you the, the accounts for every year to the register, to, the t to this um, uh, body of um, it, its uh, stiftelses tilsyne. And now there is a new law uh, revision coming up, and one issue is, of course, uh, should you have a tax exemption even if you don't give any money at all? Mm. Because in Norway you have a tax exemption for money uh, you are earned into to uh, foundation. <coughs> and in America you have to give away over three years 5% or something. Yes. And just before we uh, traveled to Vienna, Björn uh, 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 there was a national survey in Norway among uh, all the foundations yeah. from this government body, where all uh, Norwegian foundations uh, have to um, uh, state um, how big is the salary of your executive director, uh, how much uh, are the board members paid, uh, and, and how expensive is your foundation in, in, uh, when it comes to running costs? How, uh, how much do you spend every year to, just to, uh, to uh, run the foundation? And uh, they uh, ask all these questions to, um, to uh, reduce the risk of uh, uh, foundation um, capital being misused, uh, of course. So uh, I, I think... Uh, I think uh, Norway and Scandinavian countries are, are good examples when it comes to uh, socially responsible uh, foundation sector. Um, Vittoring? Uh, there's also, you mentioned, if I, understood, if I understood you right, it's also a question of the government giving up power, which is a special issue in this culture, <coughs> that if private sponsoring is uh, taking over, which will never happen, <laughs> the government would lose power. Mm -hmm. And there is this attitude here that it dates back to Joseph II, to the enlightened monarch, everything for the people, but nothing through the people. It's again, you know, uh, what is the position of the individual in a society? Does it have a strong position or a weak position? Mm. Hmm? And that's a key for this issue, I think, here. Mm. Hmm? And just for an example, what happened a few weeks ago, uh, the government decided, you know, there was, in connection with the refugees, with the refugees, there was lots of private donations gave, given to the NGOs. And the government had committed so and so many millions for the refugee issue. Then they found out that the NGOs had gotten so many private donations and they said, okay, you got all these donations, we deduct, deduct this from what we committed. I mean. 
Um, and that's all possible here. <laughs> People eat it. Hmm. Stephen Beller? Just, just, to, just to comment on, uh, someone, someone talked about the tax deductions available in the United States, um, which, uh, which is, which is, which is a, a great incentive in the United States. But that, what that does mean, though, is that the United, in the American system, the state, uh, fed, federal and state level, well, especially federal level, actually puts more money into culture than you think it does, because the, yes, because the point is that the tax, the tax deduction or rather, the the, the 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 reduction in taxes that you that you get for for, for charitable and spending on, on, on opera houses or whatever, is is actually a form of tax expenditure, what they call in, in the state. So so that in that sense, that the Americans do encourage, it's it's almost the equivalent of your t adding twenty five percent onto the end of of. Of course, it's true. Less is given for maybe museums, maybe art. No, 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 I'm, I'm, no, 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 I'm, no, 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 I'm just, I, you're right, you're right. But the point is that it, it appears even less than it actually is, because the, because the way in which the, the charitable de donations are, 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 right, are, 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 you're allowed to deduct, deduct those, means that that portion of your income that you're giving out to charities and to culture is not taxed, so, right? So therefore, that the government isn't getting that money. So to that extent, that that is a form of, of, of state expenditure. Yeah, it's a very peculiar form. Because, well, in fact, yes. I mean, when I come here, you have book theater, you have the you have all these things in a, in a small country. We have nothing given to the theater. Uh, uh, there are rich donors who build, like Eli Broad, who are constantly building new museums, and people give a lot to museums. The theater. Anything else, literature, there isn't any money given practically, and nor nor is it considered important. I, I, I want to say one other thing, and that's that it, the visibility that's gained, that may have been true in an earlier class system, but now in the United States, since it's all purely money, there is no class, really. It's all money. We no, don't have class. No, but people it's a hate social donors. status. Donors are the most hated people there are. That is, they're needed. For instance, at the University of Southern California, where I'm an emeritus of, there, a family came along named Dornsife. They build girders or something. And they insisted, they gave so much money to the college that it now has to be called, not, the, not USC, it's called Dornsife. You have to have it on your stationery. It's visibility. You have to have it on your letterhead. Where do you teach? I teach at Dornsife, yeah. okay? People <laughs> hate them. I mean, of course the deans and so forth have to cater to them, but I assure you that they're the most hated people, and so is Eli Broad, are these rich donors. Well, I suggest it's all tax but shelter. it's still visibility, uh, and it's, it's not about class, you know? It's about no. social status. No, they don't have social status. They just have, they have power. They have a certain power, but I wouldn't say they have social status. People hate them. <laughs> What do you yeah, mean? Well, well, the people you know, Marjorie, hate them, but other what? people apparently don't. But why? Well, what? they don't think they do. do they? Yeah. <laughs> they are up there, you know, in the eyes of the people. No. Uh, Bjorn Ulfsson, you have a question? I have a question. I have a question for you. Because if they give all the money, will their children get through the university? Without no, not so much. I, I, I would say one thing though that, no. that, that some of the some of the most effective um, in, uh, funding institutions in the United States are things like the Ford Foundation and the kind, various Carnegie bodies, which, which are foundations, not not individuals giving money. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, I mean the Gates Foundation. I, I, and the interesting thing about that is that, that I remember maybe 20 years ago there were various articles in, in the newspapers. We read newspapers in those days. Um, which said, well, what, you know, what about the new generation of, uh, of of all these all these mega rich people? Are they ever going to give the money? Because you know, the old the old kind of the old uh, kind of, of uh, pat patronage of the old days is dead. And then because you know, what about Bill Gates? He hasn't given any money, right? No, and of didn't. course, now he now he has Not now. To the arts. Never to the arts. Well, it's a Protestant country. A lot of money is done for social welfare and all kinds of fighting AIDS, all kinds of things of that sort. The arts, the Gates Foundation, gives nothing to the arts. You know? Well, okay, but some, uh, but you know, I, I still like the idea of curing malaria, but never mind. Sure, sure. I'm not saying it's wrong. Please, you, you, I want to get right in. People, uh, sorry, permit me to get in into the discussion, as I have lived ten years of my life in New York, and I can compare a little bit uh, this Anglo-Saxon American system of funding the art with the Austrian. 
Um, first of all, I want to agree with Stephen that we have to uh, count what the account, also the, 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 the tax concession is basically is expenditure. So it, it's not automatically that the, that the, 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 the burden on the state in the anglo sex system is smaller than in, 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 in the author. What I can say though, if you compare, for instance, the Vienna Opera and the Met, the program, mm -hmm. the, the, the Met is very, very traditional. <laughs> the Vienna Opera right. is much more accurate. If you compare the theatre scene, heavy, nearly exclusively heavily subsidized by the city of Vienna and, and the federal government, in Vienna you have hundreds, literally hundreds of, of theatres with mostly very modern, very experimental uh, plays, whereas in New York it's dominated to a large extent, but traditional musicals. If you take the film industry, again, heavily subsidized by the state. The Austria has had, there was a surge in, in the last years of Austrian film. Most of them very, very experimental, very innovative, and not the big blockbusters. <coughs> uh, <coughs> big donors kind of who search for status, they collect Picassos and they fund the tense performance of Tosca at the Metropolitan <laughs> Opera and so on. I think large diversity and innovation is better, better cared for in, in, in a system with public funding, which can afford to ignore the search for status and identification with established routine and culture. So I'm, 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 I'm uh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> no, but just to say, but I mean, what, on, yeah, I sort of agree with you, but it, you can go both ways, because in Washington, D.C. at the moment, there's actually a very lively theatre scene. Uh, mo yes, yes, well, there, well, there is. I mean, I, I know Mosaic Theatre. I mean, there was... Well, I mean, uh, well, it, dep it depends. I mean, um, uh, uh, well, uh, it seems pretty lively to me. Anyway, so, um, and uh, it's... I think the United, the United the American system is far more commercially oriented, which tends to be more traditional. But on, on the other hand, you could argue that sometimes it depends on the it depends on the state the state uh, uh, administration of, of this funding, and sometimes it, it's sometimes you get a good good a good director of this state state funding of administ administering of the funding, and that and it works out well, and then then it gets politicized, and then uh, someone who come, comes into that position who's not good, and therefore the whole thing collapses, where at least in a com at least in this thing where there's more commercial funding or more private funding, you get you have more outs, right? It's, it's, then you get the hope. The, the so it's it's a very complicated thing. I would say, and I, and I don't think we're disagreed, Marjorie. Is it? It's a question of balance, which I don't I don't think the American system. I get I just get so angry when I'm watching PBS, and every time they watch a program, a public broadcasting system. Um, we, WETA or whatever in, in Washington, um, every, every program now is a fundraising thing because they don't get any money from the federal government or, you know, or any government. And, that, and that, is a, that is on the imbalance side. That's where the Dawn Cypher, Dawn come in. Uh, and maybe, so a bit of balance would be good, I think. Thank you. Um, would anyone else from the audience, uh, yeah. Uh, Roy Freddy Andersen first, Norwegian journalist. Yes, I, I uh, would like to broaden the definition of culture and include media and journalism into that uh, perspective as well. And, <laughs> and uh, as you all know, there is a big uh, media crisis going on in these days with, uh, with the loss of uh, advertising uh, revenues and, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and uh, loss of um, circulation. And uh, in, which, uh, in which extent should the, the government, uh, the foundations and private donors play in uh, financing the journalism and the media in the future? This is a question for Jürgen Tolov and also the rest of the panel. Well, interesting question, and I uh, would welcome comments from others. I, um, I'm, I am chair of the Norwegian government's media commission, and uh, we are coming up with recommendations uh, uh, March next year as to what Norwegian government should, should do 
to strengthen media diversity and, and funding of Norwegian media, uh, the, the state part of funding. Uh, Norway is a privileged country, uh, uh, partly also Denmark and Sweden, but uh, particularly Norway perhaps, when it comes to subsidies of, of, of uh, privately owned media and, uh, and uh, there are no taxes. And, um, but uh, the uh, competition from uh, the global uh, technology companies, uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, and uh, Google is, is immensely strong and, and, and uh, taking away uh, huge parts of the, of the revenues from ads, of course. Uh, I think uh, f foundations are, are, are becoming a more, more and more interesting uh, way of uh, uh, giving uh, media companies uh, um, a long-term ownership. Um, the Irish Times is owned by a foundation. Um, one of Europe's biggest media companies, the Norwegian Shipstead, uh, which runs, uh, uh, owns uh, media in uh, 12 or 14 countries. They are also organized as a foundation. Um, um, Le Monde is a foundation, I think, um, and uh, so is uh, the, so are Danish newspapers like Jyllandsposten and uh, and uh, Politiken, and of course the Guardian and uh, Observer in Great Britain, and in Norway now, uh, uh, 60, 70 local newspapers are are bought by uh, by a major Norwegian foundation. And they don't intend to get anything out of it in terms of uh, revenues and, and uh, financial uh, gains. They, um, they are, um, the foundation is based on uh, historical ownership of local banks, and therefore they have now seen the value of buying local newspapers nobody else wants to own, uh, uh, and uh, they don't want to um, uh, <coughs> Uh, get anything financially out of it. They just want to give back to the local societies some of the values uh, uh, the banks have created for the foundation. So uh, it's uh, it's like a fairy tale. One hardly <laughs> believes it when one hears this story in in <laughs> other places in the world, I guess. But it can happen in in Norway. And um, my own foundation is also proud of uh, supporting uh, media and journalist projects both in Norway and, and abroad. And uh, we welcome uh, projects in Central Europe too, uh, even though we internationally we concentrate in, in especially uh, 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 areas uh, with political crises such as Turkey, uh, Russia, uh, Hungary and, uh, and Poland. Um, you, uh, you wanted to yeah, no, comment? I, I just wanted to pick up again a little bit on this issue of uh, private funding and, and public funding because uh, being on the spending side of uh, foundations, <laughs> uh, which I like of course, uh, puts us in a, in a position of um, sort of the art of the possible. Um, let's say, as an example, the Opera House in Oslo would never ever have happened without governmental funding. At the same time, as a MoMA would not have happened without the funding from the Fisher family. So the, the, the extreme re relationship between these two is probably in neither of them ideal. I, I, I would personally support well-organized foundational systems that would move in between the lines of public and private funding, not to make the difference between what is private company funding, mm. but rather bring it through well-organized systems of foundations which are open, transparent, and possible. And this combination, uh, in the end, most likely is the way we have to move forward, especially when it comes to funding culture. Uh, I was just at the uh, uh, Forum d'Avignon uh, in, in, in Bordeaux, where the cultural ministers of Europe just trying to look at how the, what does the funding situation in Europe look like in the future. Now, it's definitely, if we don't find a balance between well-organized uh, uh, institutional ways of thinking both private and public at the same time, we're going to lose in the, run, in the long run. And I, I definitely, the solution is there, and I do appreciate the efforts uh, happening in Norway for them, <laughs> where sort of making this transparent, open. It's a mix between public and private money coming into foundations, and at that point in time, maybe we will reach your, your dream of diversity in the world. Thank you. 
We will start uh, wrapping up now. Um, uh, by the way, uh, just an anecdote. I, I forgot when I introduced Kjetil Redal Tosen earlier today to, to mention that uh, Snöhetta is also a, a very important design company. And I, one of the design tasks now is uh, redesigning Austria's favorite water, bottled water, uh, the Römerquelle. <laughs> so good, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's turn to let's try to knit together two of our topics: funding and Wittgenstein. Mm. Um, um, not by way of biography, but by way of um, uh, concerning tourism. I remember when st I started traveling to to Vienna 25 years ago. Uh, tourist authorities in in uh, Vienna marketing themselves with uh, Sissi and uh, Strauss. Well, they have continued doing that for quite, quite a number of years. Uh, but n now two of the main profiles in, in the uh, tourist authorities marketing is uh, Schiele and Freud. Uh, so that's, uh, well, I would see it as an improvement <laughs> and, a, and a evolution. Uh, but could Wittgenstein ever be included in this? Uh, could, could Wittgenstein become part of the face of Vienna ever? Um, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, this is a more general question. Also, how could more parts of Viennese uh, culture and modernism become part of the official face of Vienna? Any comments on uh, on this question? I don't see why not. No, <laughs> no. But how could it how could it come about? <laughs> Red Miller will, te will tell us. So. Thank you very much for, for this so relevant concluding uh, statement. <laughs> this is, in fact, uh, one of the main scopes of the Wittgenstein Initiative uh, <laughs> to add Wittgenstein to the faces of Vienna, the faces that define Vienna in the world. Sorry. Hmm. In fact, uh, I understand that for large part of the world, certainly the English-speaking world, Wittgenstein is one of the certainly greatest, interesting, most interesting figures of the 20th century. And they associate him with Vienna, especially non-philosophers, but people who see him as the cultural icon that he is. And this is um, our target, to achieve the same in Vienna. We have started. Uh, we are looking, comparing to how Freud achieved this status. This was not always the case in Vienna, but it is now, or Schoenberg, because we believe that Wittgenstein belongs next to these figures, and that Austria, Vienna, certainly can hugely uh, profit um, in many respects, economically, touristically, uh, by acknowledging this. So. Uh, Yes, uh, thank you very much for posing the question. But if so, anybody else has anything else to say, an observation, I'm very grateful for recommendations. <coughs> thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Perhaps you could uh, uh, organize a, a separate seminar, symposium on this, on this topic also. Yes, yes, we certainly will. Uh, Eva Novotny? I only wanted to add a brief remark. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, in the 650 years anniversary celebrations of the University of Vienna, an exhibition on the Wiener Kreis. Yeah? Yes. Now, the Wiener Kreis is, of course, something that not automatically lends itself to an exhibition. Yeah? And uh, we were uh, a little bit hesitant how it, would, sort of how it would find its audience. And it was extremely successful. It was uh, a difficult exhibition because there's a lot of reading material and it's uh, what in German you would say a sperrige, a sperrige, yeah. uh, sperrige yeah. Gegenstand. It's not, not quite, quite easy, but it was extremely successful, attracted lots and lots and lots of visitors and had a reaction and an echo way beyond also Austria. Mm -hmm. And I think... Uh, Definitely, one could do something more with, with Wittgenstein. Yes. And uh, one of the things that is now in consideration, uh, although it needs a long way to go, <coughs> is uh, 
uh, we have uh, UNESCO has a, a special program which is called the Memory of the World, where big uh, sort of written heritage, yeah, is uh, is is memorized yeah. and, and so. And uh, I think Wittgenstein and his writings and, and the Wittgenstein archives and so on would be very well placed uh, in, yes. in such an international program. Yes. Mm. I understand. Mm. Yes, this is in preparation. Exactly as the state of Arnold Schoenberg. Mm. I thought I mentioned it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'll close this. I just wanted to um, uh, add uh, in regarding exhibition uh, for 2018, we plan a Tractatus exhibition at the House Wittgenstein. And uh, for this exhibition, we will take part of the Vienna Circle exhibition because a big part of it was about <coughs> Wittgenstein. And uh, this is the year of completion of the Tractatus, not a publication, and also the year of the end of the First World War, symbolic year for many things. Uh, this is one project we are working towards, and it will be one of a kind. Only Vienna will do such an exhibition, uh, not Cambridge, nobody else. We can export it to Norway, of course, mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> but it will originate in Vienna. Okay. We will close this session now by thanking Ramila Schweitzer for her tremendous effort. Thank you also to the very good panel, uh, Eva Novotny, Christian Wittering, Björn Ulfstar, Stephen Beller, and Ilias Kahn, who had to he had a Skype board meeting, so he had to, he had to run. These are modern times. <laughs> um, let me end by, by a relevant Wittgenstein anecdote. There is always a relevant Wittgenstein <laughs> anecdote to end sessions. Uh, and it knits our two topics <coughs> together also, uh, funding and, uh, and philosophy. Um, after Wittgenstein had uh, given away most of his, uh, his part of the family fortune, he, he returned to Scholden. And one of his uh, closest friends, the factory owner, the, the, the biggest capitalist in, in, uh, uh, in Scholden, mm, uh, was a bit, uh, uh, was a bit uh, uh, curious why Wittgenstein had put himself in this situation, giving away most of his wealth. And uh, Wittgenstein's answer might be a consolation to uh, spenders, those getting funding. And it might be a piece of advice to, to the funders, the givers. Wittgenstein said to his friend in Scholden, the worst thing a human being can experience is to walk through life as a bag full of money. <laughs> the worst thing. Thank you and good night.